I'm Livio Carenza, a PhD student at the University of Bari. Uh, and today I will, and actually at the moment, a visitor uh, in Edinburgh uh, in the HPC Europa project. Uh, and today I will present my work on active matter. Um, okay, first of all, what is active matter? Uh, imagine that active constituents such as fish in a school self-arrange in order patterns. Such systems have been known with the term active matter and they can be considered generally as a particular kind of condensed matter, soft matter. Uh, what is particular about active matter is that active uh, energy injection occurs at small length scales I mean, at the level of individual uh, constituents. Uh, so uh, the point is that injection of energy that usually in physical system happens on very large length scales. Inactive matter usually happens at the length scales of individual constituents. So these kind of systems are inherently evolved, uh, inherently out of equilibrium, far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And actually, their origin can be both biological or artificial. And actually, uh, also land scales may vary a lot. For example, from hundreds of meters uh, in uh, skulls of fish or flock of birds uh, to centimeters as um, for insect swarmings um, or uh, even to microscopical systems uh, that are actually characterized by much smaller land scales. Uh, for example, here in this picture, you're seeing a suspension of microalgae uh, and even bacteria can be the, uh, looked as active systems or cells in a mm, tissue, a, an animal tissue, for example. So actually, for example, a, a cancer cells can be looked as active matter. So uh, the aim, as we will see, the aim of active matter will, is actually uh, may have some uh, medical application. So first of all, the point is that we need to understand what is active matter, how to model it, and how to solve the equation that can model active matter. So, first of all, active constituents interact with each other, leading to interesting and unexpected properties. And in this presentation, we will con uh, I, I will basically speak uh, only about wet system. Uh, in, in active wet system, actually, constituent exchange momentum among themselves and with the surrounding environment. Think about some bacteria that are actually swimming in a fluid. They are uh, transferring some, some energy to the surrounding fluid. So the, the energy can be uh, a kinetic energy of the, these animals that are swimming, or at the same time, can be a kinetic energy of the fluid. So what is uh, interesting is that there are a lot, a, a huge amount of mm, surprising behaviors ranging from spontaneous flow that is actually uh, basically you have this energy that uh, that is due to the consumption of internal chemical energy and this can be used uh, inside this active system to sustain self-sustain flows in, 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 in the fluid environment. This uh, has been shown to lead to some superfluid and negative viscosity behavior that are uh, quite a fascinating matter in, uh, in the actual research, or even to active turbulence. Or oh, that is, active flows have been found to the vertical structures that are resembling those typical of a hydrodynamic Kolmogorov uh, turbulence uh, that is basically the one that you have uh, in the smoke of a cigarette, you know, that those vertical patterns are, can, they are an example of uh, classic turbulence. But they actually have been found in bacterial suspension. It is quite, this was quite surprising. So why active matter? First, you can use, you can think to use active matter to design new smart material that are capable to change their physical properties uh, as the environment uh, properties change. And this can be exploited even in medical applications such as drug delivery. But, and from a physical point of view, this is a testing ground for theoretical topics regarding non-equilibrium system. So this is a summary of the presentation actually I, I, I will present only the first two points and 
the last point. So we will go through the dynamical model of, for active matter and some numeric and computational methods that are usually used to deal with the uh, uh, active matter equations. And then I will produce some results on active cholesterol droplets that is actually a um, topic that I deal with in, in my visit in Edinburgh. So many theories have been developed so far to describe active matter ranging from age-based models to continuum coarse grain theories. So imagine that you have a swimmer and denote uh, the direction uh, of the axis of this of symmetry of the swimmer with a um, versor nu. Okay, now uh, you may like to describe how uh, this object, this swimmer, this animal is moving inside the fluid. So you can think that the direction of swimming is actually the one of the axis of symmetry. Uh, so you can uh, it is reason reasonable to assume that the swimming speed of such active constituents may be proportional to a certain active force that the swimmer itself is applying on the surrounding fluid. And then you may think to uh, include in, into your description uh, the effect of, uh, of the environment through uh, um, some Gaussian noise, uh, both in the velocity evolution equation or uh, in the orientation of the swimmer. So, and you can even model uh, the presence of many users by adding a, a self-interaction terms about, uh, among different, different swimmers. So, the problem of this kind of models that are actually quite successful to catch some properties of active matter is that active Brownian models, uh, as the one that are uh, in the previous slide, so, uh, are, are unfortunately suffers of some issues su uh, such as a limited of no number of constituents can be considered and environment only appears as a background noise. So particle-based theories cannot be used to model active fluids where the density of active constituents can be very high and the hydrodynamic feedback due to the gauge between the swimmers and the flow is fundamental to catch the essential features of active fluids, which is the solution. You can think to have a coarse grain description of your system. So you can use a polarization field to catch, which is the average orientation of the swimmer in a in a certain in a certain region of the space, and and even perform the same kind of operation to describe the concentration of active constituents. So you usually uh, deal with a with the evolution of a concentration field, the scalar concentration field, and the polarization field is actually describing the average orientation of the swimmer inside a certain region of the fluid. Um, and for the moment, this uh, actually, uh, even if uh, mm, the directional order is not preserved, you can have uh, a nematic order that is, uh, you may lose the head symmetry, I mean, and you may have some head-tail symmetry, and in that case, the system is not any more polar, but in, in this case, it's uh, considered as an emmatic system and must be described with a um, tensor order parameter that is a, um, commonly known as a uh, nematic tensor that is uh, invariant under head-tail tree operations. So, the, the the, um, we need evolution equation for the two order parameters that are the concentration field and, and the polarization field. You can use, if you, you assume that these animals, these bacteria are not dying or reproducing uh, during the observation the, of, of the phenomena that you want to describe, you can use a conserved equation, you have conserved concentration field and let it evolve with the advection equation and you can use a adaptive Erickson-Leslie equation for the treatment of a vector field that actually allows you to uh, describe the evolution of the direction of swimming of, uh, of the bacteria. And then you also need a, an equation for describing the evolution of a uh, of the velocity of the fluid, the underlying fluid. And this can be done with an incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. 
this equation must include some active effect uh, otherwise you would deal with a with a classical uh, evolution for for for, for a um, liquid crystal gel and to include this active stress you can look at each swimmer as a um, pusher rod that is acting uh, on the surrounding fluid and the surrounding environment with a force dipole if you perform a uh, coarse grain operation over the uh, over a, 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 a sufficiently big amount of swimmers you end with a stress tensor a, an active stress tensor that is depe uh, dependent on the um, the direction of swimming as expected act actually and these effects can be controlled by a, an activity parameter that uh, I, I, I um, uh, actually zeta with this with this zeta active parameter. Yeah. The equation for active fluids are actually very very uh, expensive for for uh, from a computational point of view. You have three different equations. One of them is a vector. Two of them are vector. Uh, equation, so it means a lot of field to evolve, and this is why mm, lattice Boltzmann method has been widely used in the analysis of active uh, of active fluids. Uh, lattice Boltzmann method are a class of computational methods based on a disc discretized version of the Boltzmann equation, where both physical and velocity spaced are discretized. So fluid particles can only move in definite direction in space and mm, you have a distribution function defined on the di discrete lattice on grid points and along lattice velocities. Uh, so assuming the system close to equilibrium, the collision operator can be expanded in terms of an equilibrium set of distribution function and this allows you to reduce incredibly the amount of computational power uh, needed to integrate uh, hydrodynamic equation with respect to mm, more common methods like finite difference uh, methods or pseudo spectral methods. So, uh, actually, another feature of Lattice Boltzmann method is that they can be easily parallelized um, because of two reasons. First of all, um, Lattice Boltzmann method, yes, is fast, but is uh, actually is um, in deserves a lot, you need a lot of memory resources. And you still have to deal with long processing times. So uh, in order to reduce the amount of uh, time needed to integrate uh, active matter equation, you can think to divide uh, the computational domain in uh, uh, subgrid, in subdomains. And uh, you may use some um, tools like MPI to parallelize uh, your code. So this means that um, actually uh, each processor uh, is able to communicate uh, e e with each other inside the, a, a unique uh, um, program. And so it's like you have a lot of workers that they, uh, uh, they are uh, working on the same project, sharing uh, the data with a protocol that is uh, actually uh, controlled by the the, uh, the message passing interface that you're implementing. This the the main problem uh, when dealing with integration of uh, differential equation is that when you get to the end, when you, when you get to the size of your uh, your computational size, you may like to perform a, a derivative, for example, but the data that you need are uh, share, uh, they are not shared with the with the other processor. So you need uh, you, you need a protocol to communicate with with the uh, with processors inside a unique execution of the program. And here you see a graph showing uh, a strong scaling test. So on the x-axis, you see the number of processors that has been used to integrate the dynamical equation. And on the y-axis, you see the speed up uh, corresponding to the 
I mean, uh, normalize with respect, of uh, with respect to the amount of time that you need to operate the same uh, operation, the same evolution with just one processor. You see that uh, with the black line, you see uh, the e ideal scaling, and you see that using Archer or uh, Marconi, that are two infrastructure, actually Archer is the infrastructure that I've been using here in Edinburgh, you see that the scaling is pretty good, actually on, very, very close to the ideal one. And uh, this actually, um, to have an idea, uh, you can get results in one day uh, if you're using 256 processor, you can get results that otherwise using just one processor you would get in almost one year. <laughs> that is a, something very good actually <laughs> for your research. Um, so uh, I think that I'm running out of time so I will skip uh, the part about spontaneous flow and I will directly go on the part uh, on active droplets. Uh, this is uh, my research group. I've been working here in a, uh, Edinburgh, Professor Davide Marenduzzo, and actually Giuseppe Gonnella is my tutor in Bari, and while Giuseppe Negro is a, um, a, a colleague of mine that is actually here in Edinburgh as well for the same project, uh, we have been working together on the analysis of active droplets. The point is, what happens if activity is confined? Recent experience, uh, experiments managed to confine active behavior in shells of liquid crystals, and they have shown that shells rotate under the effect of activity injection, active injection. So the point is that uh, actually in, in this moment, uh, we are looking for some droplet propulsion uh, that, is, uh, that may be exploited in application aimed at drug delivery. So the point is that to simulate such system, a three-dimensional approach is compulsory. And for the same reason, you need an HPC approach, so a high performance computing approach. So in this slide, you see uh, what uh, we simulated in an active pneumatic droplet. This droplet, you see in the, the top left panel of uh, the figure on the right, you see that this droplet is actually uh, characterized by the deformation pattern of the, the pneumatic field and characterized by two bojums. You can see them from the top view in the middle left panel of the figure. They are characterized by the vortex. This vortex in the pneumatic pattern also generates a flow that is actually, uh, that is forcing the droplet to rotate. And this is generating a velocity field, not trivial velocity field, uh, in, in, in the planar configuration, as you maybe uh, you see better in, a, in this video showing the evolution, the dynamics of this droplet. And so this is actually, the, this was the first step of our research here in Edinburgh that was trying to replicate experimental results. And actually we managed since this droplet this pneumatic droplet is rotating and generating a not trivial velocity field. Uh, but the point is that uh, we, were looked, we were looking for some other property, actually. We want this droplet not only to rotate, but to move. Uh, if the point is that maybe the pneumatic system, not the best one, uh, to, to get a propulsion. This is why, uh, this is why uh, um, we, we try to simulate active chiral uh, droplets. First of all, chirality is ubiquitous in biological matter. Think about DNA. DNA is characterized by an helix, and even actomyosin mm, systems and fibers, the one that actually uh, allows for the movement uh, of muscle, contraction of muscles in, in animals, they are chiral system. Microtubules that are some um, structure that are implemented for the, the, in cell motility and division uh, are chiral as well. And chirality is at the base of life and is exploited in cell motility, uh, for example, in motor proteins or um, flagella of bacteria, as you can see in the, 
in the in the picture on uh, the usually bacteria are equipped with a um, with flagella these flagella are uh, uh, they form an helix so they are these are chiral systems, the, if these eggs rotate, the bacteria is propelled in the direction of its axis of symmetry. So we try to make this droplet, the droplet of the previous light, chiral. And what we found was that uh, the defect configuration changed according to the um, chirality of the, um, of, of the liquid crystal. And we managed, actually, to get a different dynamics. You see the droplet still rotates, still rotates, but at the same time, the movement uh, of this fun-like movement is leading to cell propulsion is here, as you see in the movie. So this may be a road, a path to be followed, uh, follow uh, in order to obtain, uh, from an experimental point of view, uh, in order to obtain uh, cell motility. Actually, I think that I took more than the time that uh, and I, I will close my presentation here and I, I would be glad to answer any question. Uh, yes, Michael, the point, the point is that in, uh, uh, it's, it's not yet clear. Uh, in the works of Michael Cates and Julia Yeomans, uh, this was, um, they already realized that uh, active system may undergo uh, a negative viscosity state, but at first they, mm, uh, it, it actually, uh, they were looking at this phenomena as unstable. At the moment, some experiments are showing that uh, this mode is actually possible in active matter. And even some numerical experiments are uh, confirming uh, this point. So um, there is no uh, completure about negative viscosity. Uh, but um, so y yes, can be seen as a type of instability if you look at this as a, from, from the point uh, from um, the point of view of uh, spontaneous flow. So yes, spontaneous flow are generating a flow that is actually, uh, that is generating a negative viscosity state. The, um, localized and short-lived in, sim oh, so the question is, so these instabilities are localized and short-lived in simulations. Uh, mm, it depends, again. It depends on the uh, geometry of the system. So it depends on boundary conditions and even on the intensity of the active forcing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other question? OK. I don't think there's any more questions. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you do have any questions, you can contact me or Olivio. Um, most of you know how to contact me anyway, but you can find me on the EPCC webpage. And if you want to get in touch with Livio, just contact me and I can put you in touch. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Livio.